All right, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to Accelerate Your Career. I am Julie Cummins. I'm a program manager here at the Colorado School of Mines Foundation. Um, before we get started, I would just like to go over a few housekeeping rules and the event logistics. So um, we have today with us, Amy Marcello. She'll go ahead and do her presentation. We have time allotted at the very end for Q&A. So please ensure that you are muted throughout the presentation. Once we get to the Q&A portion at uh, the last 15 to 20 minutes towards the end, we'll open it up. You'll be able to submit questions via the chat and you'll also be able to raise your hand via the reactions bar tool down at the bottom of your screen and we'll call on you. And then at that time you can unmute yourself and ask your question. But again, until then, just stay muted, please. And we'll go ahead, I will toss it over to Amy um, to go ahead and get us started. I'll stop sharing my screen. Amy, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, thank you, Julie, so much for having me. So appreciate that. Okay, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so get to this thing. Break it, back it up here. So welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I love um, going through these presentations and seeing if there's ways that I can add value to help people accelerate their career. And um, mostly it starts uh, with the job search. So uh, Julie and I were just talking about this today. Um, basically, uh, I started this company about seven years ago, and the reason was probably from my own frustration <laughs> of trying to manage my career. So I come from a background where I'm really just first generation uh, college graduate. My sister and I actually were the first two people from our family to graduate from college. So I got a master's degree and she ended up getting her PhD and she's actually a, a Colorado State University professor there. So, um, you know, education was really important to us, but also we just felt really kind of clueless scaffolding up in our career. And I had worked with many um, executive coaches over the way and, um, and fabulous people got great information, but no real system of how to navigate through job searching and, and accelerating your career. Um, there are some people that seem to be innately great at it, um, and but there's you know such a changing environment today with our you know our ecosystem, so to speak, our labor market. Um, and it's just a lot to navigate. And I, I think that the job search process is a little bit broken. Most executive coaches and career coaches would 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 speak to that. And so, you know, I, I start this company to really optimize all those processes to, to pull it together and create some frameworks to help you quickly navigate through the job search process and to um, actually, you know, accelerate your career at the same time. So, you know, you could go from role to role and um, it could actually really hurt your trajectory if you're not strategizing this in a, a good way. And so it really helps to to know how this works. So just a little bit about my background. Um, I have professionally branded probably a thousand, I was counting this the other day, it's crazy, like a thousand plus people from mid-level to C-suite from Fortune 2, I haven't done Walmart yet, but from Fortune 2 companies and below to market them out for new roles. So my, my company, if you think about it, we're really, you know, job search career experts. That's what, that's what we do. So um, along the way, I've, I've in this weird way learned, and I usually brand them through their resume and LinkedIn development first, you know, and then we're going through some marketing and networking um, ways to get them to these new roles. So it's kind of like reverse recruiting when you think about it. Um, so I, I've, I've learned these like really unique things about their leadership abilities and how they've scaffolded it up. So I wanted to take that and put it into a framework, you know, to share with other people, which is what I've done over the years. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about me. Um, and then to going the wrong way here. Um, and then just so you know, this whole framework is really built out of a business framework, which is exactly where I think this should be. Um, and so, you know, by doing so, I'm able to cut the job search time in half. And I usually help people grow their salaries along the way. So, 
I'll show you um, a bit of that framework today to help you in this process. So at this point, I really want you to start thinking um, in a different uh, way now. So instead of thinking as an employee, if you're an employee out there, I really want you to start thinking as a consultant and your career is really your own personal business. And I want you to think about treating it as um, something like you ink, like call it you ink. And I'm sure you might've heard of that concept before, but that's really what this is about like once you start looking at your career differently, um, the job search is really built around a consultative strategy. Um, it's almost uh, equivalent to selling sales services. And, and I hate to say selling for a job search because really being a consultant is about bringing value to companies, finding solutions for them and being paid accordingly for for that for a value based salary and and that's really what i want for you is to have a value based salary versus a market rate so we're going to talk about a couple of these concepts all right so first of all um today i just want to kind of go over a couple of these topics like what's going on in the labor you, you know in the labor market um, I want to teach you signs of possible lay layoffs. Maybe you know this, but I want to go over this because sometimes pe people miss this. Um, so I want to talk about ways to um, identify jobs outside your industry if you're looking. I want to talk about ways to actually chart new courses, like if you want to pivot to a different career. And then I want to talk about things that I have found along the way that really set you apart from your competition. I think really just having this mind, mind frame when you think about it you know, at the end of this, is really going to be a game changer for you. Um, and then I want to teach you my, my rapid job search strategy. So our company has um, this rapid job search strategy that really, you know, does cut your search time in half because there's so much information out there. People get lost um, and it, it feels like a broken system and they feel defeated. And I don't want you to feel defeated. I want you to feel good about what you are bringing to work. I want you to feel good about yourself. And I really want you to know in your mind that you'll be able to job search effectively no matter what the market brings you know whatever happens in your job i should say all right uh, we're gonna we're gonna pull out the importance of professionally branding and carving out a value pitch and i hate the term value pitch but it really is your value proposition you know and and, and we'll we'll talk about that and how you can put that on your resume your linkedin but just by the nature of carving that out on your resume and linkedin is really gonna give you what is needed to effectively network and interview and get and land high quality roles. So I'll teach you how to stand out with that. And then I want you to be able to focus on ways to accelerate your job search. So you're really focusing more about finding the right roles. Um, and then understand the importance of interview prep, like the, you know, how important it is to prep for interviews. You know, winging it is not, not a great <laughs> strategy today. Um, and then ultimately, I really want to teach you how to negotiate for a value-based salary versus, you know, um, a market rate salary. All right. So let's talk quickly just about what's going on in the labor market. It's kind of crazy, right? We just came out. We're not, we didn't come out of this pandemic. We're actually in it. It's, it's uh, everyone's still at home. Every, all my clients, I work just so you know, I work virtually and I work nationally with clients. Um, I also forgot to mention to you guys, I... Um, and taking this PowerPoint and making a PDF out of it, and I'll send it to you after this, or, or Julie will send it to you after this, so you don't have to take notes. Um, I'll be sending this information to you. But anyway, you've heard of the, uh, the great uh, resignation, but they're really at the forefront of this, of the pandemic, was the great migration. And I'm sure you guys are all living it, right? You're, you're working at home virtually. You're trying to manage your life. Probably some of you are managing kids. Um, it's been kind of cray cray <laughs> and, and, uh, and we all know it. And so, um, but there are some positives that have come out of it. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the labor market in general for a minute. All right. So the great migration really to remote work after the pandemic has been, had a huge impact of how people think about working, right? So um, I'd say 82%. So the Gartner survey that I just looked up said 82% of company leaders plan to allow employees to work remotely some of the time, which is really huge. I mean, before the pandemic, I mean, this is a plus that has come out, out of the pandemic in some ways, it's a negative, but you know, a plus in the sense that we now are able to have a little bit more control of our lives. We're not chained to a desk on a daily basis. We don't have to commute. You know, some people spend an hour plus each way commuting. And today, like we have much more leeway that right way right so that's the plus side of this pandemic um, i know of a lot of clients that recruit also for companies and i know of a lot of clients that are actually going 
full fully remote because they don't want to spend the thousands of dollars monthly, you know, uh, for office space. So uh, there are many people now thinking about living in all places of the world if they can get internet access and work. So there is some freedom to this, which is great. We're having more say. Okay, that being said, on the negative side of this, on a 2021 Gallup survey is that 57% of US workers are stressed out, you know, I think, hopefully this will get a little better. There, the huge stress out, I think, from the research that I've led and just from or read and the, from the clients that I have talked to has been, you know, one, just transferring over to this remote space and all trying to deal with it. And then, and then two, you know, all, all that has trickled down as an, you know, as a piece of this at some point, me, meaning um, companies have not survived. They've had to have a lot of layoffs, a lot of departmental shifts, you know, ramping up teams. It's all been huge. And so I think that there's a ton of stress around that. And some of those stressors hopefully we'll get better. You know, that being said, we're still 57% and the rest of the world's at 43%. So, um, you know, hang on a little bit there. The pandemic's not over, but I, I think that a big piece of this has, you know, has to be around this huge shift that we are all making. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the reasons for changing jobs, because at some point you might get laid off. I mean, that might happen. I couldn't get really the research around, you know, how many people get, or how many times a person gets laid off. Um, I, you know, I'm hearing around two to three times in their lifetime. I don't know. I mean, what, what I have seen and what I know for sure is technology has become a huge driver right, for change in our economic system. And so the market that our parents were in are completely different than the market we're in today. And so what's happening is that businesses are expanding and they're contracting way faster today than they were, you know, 10 years ago even. And so when that happens, um, there's mergers and acquisitions that are, are occurring, right? And so, and 70 to 90% of those mergers and acquisitions, um, 70, you know, are failing. And, and what that really means, and I know this, so I, I have a sister-in-law that has actually built a billion dollar company. And, and so I watched her from the ground up do this. And what's really interesting is, you know, she was given some money, you know, from these uh, backers to start this company. And her goal was to go through and, and buy out all these small companies and get their clients. It was really to buy the client base. And therefore, you know, she was, she was taking all these companies and a lot of workers were getting displaced in it, but that was helping them build their business. That's what's happening. Everything is so rapidly changing because of technology and the competition so fierce. The companies are expanding and contracting in such a quicker way that sometimes people get displaced. The valuable workers usually are maintained. And, and I know this because I work with, I work with them and like I help brand them. You know, these are the people that are staying on the forefront of their career growth. These are the people that are investing and getting the help they need to stay on top. And, and when I say stay on top, I don't mean to sound like it's a rat race. You're on a giant hamster wheel. There's no value here. Um, I don't mean to freak you out or burn you out just by saying that. What I'm saying is um, they're being smart about how they work. And you guys have heard that term, like work harder, uh, uh, work smarter, you know, or work smarter, not harder, right? And so this is what I really want you guys to learn. And a piece of that is on the forefront with this job search, right? So don't get too worried about that piece. I just want you to understand that things do move so much faster. And so it's that much more important that A, you have a job search strategy and B, you have a career strategy. Happenstance doesn't work anymore. It's really up to you. All right, so other reasons why people leave, are there bad leaders? There's bad financials, corners are cut, employees are taken for granted. There's poor work-life balance. And many of you guys have felt this already, you know? Or the biggest thing that I've seen out in companies are people are not groomed for growth. And the reason is, you know, often is, again, you know, companies are just trying to stay, you know, they're just trying to keep up as well. And so often um, that piece doesn't seem like such an obvious piece, you know, and, and attrition is a huge detrimental fact on a company. So the healthy companies get that and they will groom their clients to grow. Um, the other ones have a harder time. And if you like the company that you're at, they're not grooming you to grow, make sure you groom yourself. Okay. That's really all that, you know, you have to do is just take the time, invest in yourself and groom yourself. All right. Um, all right. So moving along here. <laughs> 
um, let's talk about possible si signs of possible layoffs. Okay, so we wanna hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Okay, so this is about being smart in your career and being smart with the job search. All right, so um, I would say mostly, um, I, I would say the biggest sign to look for are the senior executives leaving, all right? So there's always a sign of bleak earnings. Not everyone's privy to that. So you might not know that. There's excessive budget cuts or missed revenue targets. So the people in sales usually hear about that, right? Um, clients leave, right? So that might be one. Senior executives obviously is, I think, one of the biggest ones. And then employees start leaving in droves, right? And um, if there's merger and acquisitions taking place, and again, like we talked about, 70% fail, you know, if that's taking place in your company, be acutely aware of what's going on and watch for all the signs, all right? Um, if you are being left out for some reason, maybe it has nothing to do with financials. There's something to do with your performance, but you are not aware of it. You know, not every boss, every leader is, is capable of communicating what they need from you, okay? And so if that's happening, um, and you're starting to feel your boss avoid you <laughs> and they're not communicating, I would say, you know, check in with them, make sure everything's okay. Um, but if not, that might be a sign too. So if you're having a gut reaction that something's wrong, you know, then I want you to be job opportunity ready and job opportunity ready means get your resume ready. It means get your LinkedIn ready and, and start hitting that first tier network that you have and start looking for jobs. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay. All right, so layoffs happen, and they often happen on Fridays, just so you know. They do that, you know, so people can go home for the weekend and process. Um, and then they also happen at the end of the year. We're starting to get to the end of the year. So if you're feeling anything like this, you know, uh, be aware. Get job opportunity ready, okay? You should always be job opportunity ready. It means to be, you know, have all your, you know, settings on LinkedIn set. It means having your resume ready, um, like really take your LinkedIn serious. Um, I recruit, I know a million recruiters. We are all recruiting on LinkedIn mostly really. So, um, it's, it's really the only game in town. <laughs> it's kind of like a monopoly, even though it's not supposed to be one. All right. So sometimes you need to pivot in your career. And there were a lot of questions about that and transitioning. And so I want to talk about how you can pivot in your career and that it's okay to pivot in your career and, and what to expect so that you understand that. Um, all humans need to grow. It's just how we're built. And I think that it's, it's just um, part of our nature. And often if you're feeling burnt out or you're just tired of what you're doing and you need to pivot, um, don't sweat it. We help people all the time transition to new roles, new roles, new industries. Um, and there's different ways of doing it. And, and what really helps at the forefront is actually mapping a strategy out. That's what's really important is to map it out. Sometimes it's very simple and um, just lost my headphone there. Sometimes it's very simple and you can actually, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a simple thing. I just want to get out of this industry. Like I was working with someone recently, the oil and gas industry is struggling a little bit. And he just wanted to, you know, he needed to get out. He's feeling that he might be laid off. And so we're looking, we're getting everything ready. We're getting him job opportunity ready. And he's looking at other industries because the oil and gas industry is suffering right now. And he's looking for other places to go, you know? So, and he's in operations at a leadership role and he, you know, probably like mid leadership and he, um, he wants to transfer and he can, he can transfer all his plant skills over to a different area. So a different arena, like a, um, it might be fracking, it might be some large construction type of, you know, thing or, or green energy, right? So there's different places that he can transfer his abilities over. When you're transferring over from industry to industry and the same type of role, what you can expect is either a lateral move. Sometimes you might go down one level sometimes not. Right. So that's pretty typical, you know, every now and then, you know, if someone has a great connection or they're networking or they're bringing some super valuable piece with them, they can transfer over to a different industry and they, they can move up. I find that rare, but I'm never saying ever. Right. Um, everything about the job search process is about supply and demand and then the value that you are bringing to a company. Okay. So that it's really about that. Um, the next thing you need to know is if you're pivoting to a different type of role entirely, like I had a woman that was a CEO of a company and she made it to the top 
yay. And then she's like, don't want to be here. I'm, I'm tired of being in the hot seat. And so now I, you know, I need to find something different. And so, you know, we mapped her out, we figured out the skill sets that she was best at. And really what she realized was she had this lifelong um, love of training, of educating people. And so we ended up taking all of her skill sets from a resume. We went through and we pulled out training from every single experience and all the results that came around that. And, um, and we networked her out to all the right people so that she could get a good training role. So either, you know, you have a company like me that's networking you out for it, or you can do it yourself. You find the companies, um, you find the roles, but you ask for help. You say, look, you know, I'm moving over to here, but hey, I, you know, I was a CEO. Like I know how companies run. I could take your training department and make it amazing and have it, you know, help build and grow your company, right? So she's bringing a lot of extra bonus that most people don't have to the training industry. So that's how you can take your skill sets and move them over. Everyone has some type of unique skill sets that they pick up along the way. And, you know, so if you don't have exactly what those are, you can transfer, them, you know, or you, you, you could either say, you know, I'm bringing a value add with this, or you can skill up if you need to. Sometimes people need to go back and get, you know, another degree. Um, I had a guy that was a, um, uh, uh, he was an orthopedic person not saying this right, but a uh, chiropractor. And so, so he was a chiropractor and he wanted to go into data. So he took one of those data boot camps, um, and he's doing data in healthcare now, which is great, right? Do you see how you can tie those two in? So those are ways that you can pivot to this other arena if need be. All right. And if, in that case, like sometimes, sometimes it, it means taking, you know, again, if you're transferring to a whole nother arena, it might be take a step down, but again, you love what you're doing now and it's, you're going to shoot up. So don't worry so much about the dip down. If you, you know, can afford to, obviously, you know, you have to eat, but if you can dip down then dip down and, and go up, sometimes people have logistics, they have families to take care of, et cetera. And so we might need to roadmap it. And I think of it like Frogger, like the Frogger video game where, um, where you have to kind of sidestep in order before you go over, you know, so it might be, I can't, start school right now, but my kid's going to graduate in two years. So I'm going to start taking a class or two every semester, right? Slowly work on it. I'm going to get a job that's a little bit more in between the role that I'm going for. I'm going to finish up my schooling in two years, and then I'm going to get that degree. So you can actually like leapfrog kind of over to that place. So that's typically how you can pivot in your career, right? <laughs> Let's talk now about ways you can stand out in for a new role, okay? So what are ways that you can stand out for a new role, be it you're going for a job, okay? So you're writing this in your resume, you're, you're talking about this when you're networking, or you're actually in the job, okay? So these all kind of apply, all right? So if, if you wanna stand out in a role, one of the, the biggest things, really the concept is you need to stand out and bring value beyond the status quo, all right? So your job has asked you to do such, a, you know, like certain criteria, certain criteria for a job, like don't just do that, do more than that, right? So you might be someone that works in operations for some reason, or you work, um, let's just say you work in an, in an, in an engineering role and um, you're asked to basically uh, do X, Y, and Z. But you go beyond that and you realize, you know, you're doing this, but you also, there's no training for this area when new people come in. There's no systems in place. There's no policies in place, right? So when, when companies grow and expand, they constantly need extra things. They need things like building the, the manuals, right? Like the, um, the training for new people coming in, building the policies that people can read about. So everyone has continuity and the new roles that they come in. So all those, you know, or maybe the system needs to be optimized. Maybe there's, there's um, you're, you're working in something and you see all, all these problems in your role and it, you know, it's costing the company money, right? So figure out how to optimize that um, and save the company money. So those are all the little extra things that go that bring value beyond the status quo. And those are the things that people put on their resume, right? And if you have a proven track record in every role of doing that, you know, that's how you start building up your salary base. 
Does that make sense? Like, you know, some people, when I brand them, you know, he saved 10,000 on this job, he saved 20,000 and then 50,000. And over the last 10 years, you know, saved X amount, right? And some of those people are in the millions when I talk about saving, you know? So, so it's that proven track record that says, hey, I don't just deserve you know, the, um, the average market rate, you know, salary for this, I, I, you know, deserve the high rate because, uh, you know, by default, I have traditionally saved in the last 10 years, X amount for a company, right? Okay. So the next thing is you need to make sure that you are an excellent communicator. So people, you know, need people to be able to work well with other people. Right. And that means to communicate and communicate in a way that builds trust. I love that our society is getting to this place where we, have to care for one another, that it's important. You know, we're all working together in symbiosis. Like we, we have to get along in order to be rowing in the same direction. So you could be the best strategist in the world, but if you can't collaborate with other people, if you can't communicate effectively, if you can't build trust, you know, working together, then you're only going to go so far. You know, I, we had this great guy that I worked with um, he was a CXO and he um, was, was this a strategy, like the chief strategist, I think it was like CRO or C, I don't know. Um, so he was a CXO. So he was like a chief strategy officer and he had an amazing strategy, but he was not good at building teams at all and totally let go. So, so those things happen when you're not, you know, fully well-rounded. So jobs today are demanding that we're not just good at something that we're also good with collaborating with people and working with teams because if that doesn't happen you know people can't work together to make big things happen and move mountains um so that's really important so if you're in a job i would say can consistently communicate your value you know um by by sharing your progress data results like on a cadence just so that your boss and the higher ups know um you know communicate also positive things like just communicate in a way that you're trying to be proactive um and you're bringing value okay so um if you also work in a company i would say what's really important and this you could put on your resume is to that you share knowledge right that you give presentations um, you spearhead meetings, you give trainings, you do workshops, you're sharing knowledge. That, that knowledge piece is really huge. Um, it's important that you get support in your role, but you also show you support. So on your resume, you could, if you do this, you can show, you know, be a coach or, or, you know, you could say, you know, um, I'm a coach, I'm a mentor. I give back, you know, I collaborate on multiple levels. So, so that, that piece is really huge. Um, the next is really what your professional presence is. And, and you guys all know that, like, how do you visually look? How are you showing up every day when you're on the zoom call, which now everyone's on a zoom call, or if you're in the office, are you dressing nicely? Like, are you really showing up to, do you look like a leader? Even if you aren't a leader, do you look like someone that people would want to go to, to ask questions, you know, so it doesn't matter if you're in the lowest of jobs. You know, if you show up looking professional, like one to two jobs ahead of you, they're going to see that they're going to visualize you as that leader when they're thinking about, oh, you know, um, can, can Josh, you know, be at this higher level, right? And, and so your visual presence is obviously really important. But what's even more you know, um, uh, important is, is the inside piece of you, right? So what are you developing internally, intellectually, right? So are you developing a leadership and team building style. I don't care what level that you're at. I think everyone should learn leadership, communication skills, and team building skills. And if you look up, if you Google leadership styles, there's a couple out there that are commonly used today that you know we use in the branding. And one of them is the servant leadership style. Um, another one's the transformational leadership style. So go out there and Google it and figure out what your leadership style is and start reading about it and start building that in yourself. You know, even if you're a person that doesn't want to be at the VP level, even if you're a person that, you know, is fine, some people hit that director level and they're good. They might even hit the manager level and just be good. Um, that is totally fine, but you want to still be, you know, you want to still be solid in your, you know, job. You want to be valued in your job. You want to survive the potential layoffs. You know, you want to be so valuable that they don't want to let you go. And so, you know, by doing so, by, by doing this 
personal development, you're also doing, you know, this, this piece of you that's going to carry over to your home and your life, which is huge, right? You can take everything that you learn, you know, in this piece and take it home, right? And that, and so, so this is where you can take everything that you get out of your career and bring it into your own personal life for growth, right? Right. The last thing that I wanted to state that I think stands out, and this is huge, 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 and people do not get this. So many people miss this. They don't even think to do it. You know, they, they sometimes are adverse to this is business acumen. Like business acumen is such an important piece of your work. You need to not only know what you do, but the business behind it. So the more you know about running a business, the more of an asset you can be in your area of expertise. So when we start out in new jobs and no one teaches us what, how people scaffold up, when you start out, you're in the doing mode, right? You're totally in the doing mode. And then the next you're managing the doing mode, right? And then after that, you're directing the managers that are managing the doers, right? And then after that, you're doing more of the regional you know, piece where you're, you're, you're actually, um, and, and at the director level, you actually have to really start knowing the business of your department. Okay. So you're directing, you're probably like directing a department at the regional level. You're actually directing multiple departments, which could be a program. Right. And so, you know, you have to know the business of that piece. And then once you start getting into operations, right, the VP of ops, VP of programs, like they're running all of that. They're running a portion of the business. And then ops is like, they're running the business, right? So each piece scaffolds up, not just in roles, but in business knowledge and in leadership knowledge. So when you think about growing in your career, start thinking about the scaffolding up that you need and always have a go-to place of where you find this information. Always have a go-to person, a sponsor or a mentor that's going to help keep you growing along the way. Get a coach if you don't have one, right? So um, it's just like if you're a consultant, you're getting a business coach. I have a business coach. You need people out there to help you grow and you need to keep scaffolding along the way. All right, so you're here for the job search strategy. Let me tell you that piece. All right, so the rapid job search strategy that you know we have come up with really focuses on, on five different areas. And the first we've talked about, right? You, I want you to think like a consultant um, that's here to get some business. I really want you in that when you're looking for a job search, you have to be like fully in it. No matter where you interview, I want you to think I'm gonna try and get that job. Even if you don't want that job, I want you to have the offer because I have seen many people get all the way to the offer stage and the true job was not revealed to them or they tweak the job for that person. So you never know what you're going to get until the very end. Does that make sense? So for better or for worse, usually for better, I would say. Um, so I want you to go into this thinking, I'm a consultant. I'm not here to sell. I'm here to bring value. Like, just like today I hear, I'm here to bring value to you. I, I really want you to do well in your job search. I really want to help you grow your career. It's why I started this company. And I want you to have a mission in your job to care, you know, like to care and have something, some reason for getting up to go you know, to work every day. So we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So the second thing is you have to develop an authentic, authentic, uh, authentic, it has to be real, right? Professional brand that is you, you know, my son has this beautiful, crazy, curly hair. He's half Filipino <laughs> and it used to be like super short. And he has just gotten this beautiful curly hair. And at first I was like, maybe he should cut it. He's about to enter the career world, but he is all professional decked out. And he just owns it. <laughs> and so, you know, so the professional brand obviously is not just your image. It's, but, but it's also about authentically owning the value that you want to bring. And, and so both those pieces play into it. And the best place to start with your brand is actually to start building it on your resume. Okay. And then, and then once you do the work on the resume, transfer that over to your LinkedIn. So we'll talk about what's in that as well. All right. The third thing really is to align your resume and people don't get this. Every time that you go to apply for a job, you have to align your resume. People send out resumes like all the time. They spray and pray their resumes like all over God's creation. And so they, you know, they don't really think about um, the fact that it's a marketing tool. Your resume and your LinkedIn profile are both marketing tools. And so if you don't think of it that way, you're going to miss the boat. And so that's, you know, 
that's where the rejection comes in. So there's the aligning on your resume um, for each job description. We'll talk about that. And then there's also um, aligning, you know, the keywords. So the keywords are, it's a, it's a hoop that we have to jump through, but we'll talk about the keywords in the applicant tracking system. All right, so the fourth thing you need to know is when you apply and you network, you're using a consultative approach. You're going out there and you want to add value, right? And the best way to do that is having some type of human connection. So I don't care if you're applying or you're networking, there needs to be some type of human connection. I want you to remember that from this point on. I also want you to remember that 85% of jobs come through some form of networking. Focus on networking, get in front of the job search, the job boards, it's just a broken system. And so I'm not saying that you can't get jobs from applying, but you'll get way more traction if you focus your efforts on networking. So we'll talk about that piece. And then lastly, I want you to get the job. <laughs> and in order to get the job, you have to know how to interview well. And again, the interview is there's a consultative strategy. It's just like, you know, if you're going in, there's an opening and a closing to the strategy. And then there's a touch base afterwards to stand out so that they really get inspired and want to hire you above all else, you know, and you have to show your unique brand in it, but you also have to show your care for their problems and you have to help them solve them and talk about that. Or, or if they need a transformation, you have to, you know, paint the transformation that you can make. So we'll talk more about that. And then I really want you to negotiate for, you know, a value-based salary. Okay. All right. So, so one, right. Think like a consultant. I have to move these little boxes all around. <laughs> um, let's see here. There was a Okay, so I want you to, um, sorry about that. I want you to, again, think like a consultant. So let's talk about the first piece, right? The mindset of actually job searching. Job searching is tough. Job searching takes time. Job searching is about supply and demand. <laughs> and so some people can get jobs like that. It really feels defeating, right? Like a broken system. Like you're like, oh, well, my friend, you know, Corey got a job and two weeks, right? Or he just got a job in a day. Well, hey, good for Corey. Corey's, you know, might be a nurse or something that is in high demand, right? So people that are in high demand, their, their resumes could look like, you know, anything <laughs> on the base level. If you're in the doing mode, in the doing mode, okay? So not the manager, the director, or the higher ups, they can't be bad. But, you know, in the doing ro ro you know, or role, half the time, they don't even need a resume or it doesn't matter what their resume looks like. Um, but for other people, if you're in marketing, which is a high uh, supply type of place, it's a high demand also, but it's also a high supply type of you know, role, it's really important uh, um, that you have one that really stands out so you can get a, a ahead of the competition. So you have to think like that. So you're a consultant, you ink is your company, and you're really starting to um, think about how am I going to market to these people to get noticed, right? And so you got to look at your target audience and see, you know, are there a million people applying for these jobs or just a couple? How much effort do I need to put into this to get my clients, so to speak, which in this case would be your employers, right? All right. So um, you also need to create job search goals and stick to them. Just like, a, you know, in a business, you have to have sales goals, right? So you have to think of this, like I have sales goals. I have to reach out and I have to apply for two jobs a day or three to five companies a day. And then if I have no job, I need to double that, right? So that's what's really important. So there needs to be a goal. You also have to ensure, again, that you have the, the business acumen and the skills needed to get the right roles and to stand out, right? So if you don't, that's okay. 75, or I would say like of the jobs, people have 75% of what they're asking for. Usually these jobs descriptions have this huge wish list, right? And so most people only have 75% and that's okay. So if you go in, you know, and you're applying for a job and, and you only have 75%, well, just say, hey, you know, I'm willing to skill up or I'll do whatever I need to do to get that other 25%. So you just let me know the best route for that and I'll do that. Or I know the best route and this is how I'll do it. Take care of it for them, right? And so, so that's how that, that piece works. Um, and again, uh, LinkedIn Learning Library has a great, uh, they have a great learning library. So it used to be called Linda, I think it was lynda.com's, you know, library. And then it became, you know, they got bought. And so LinkedIn owns them and it's a great place. If you just do either the career premium 
or the Sales Navigator free 30 day, you can get that for free and they have certifications and everything. So it's a great way to skill up. And everyone knows about, you know, is it Udemy, Udemy? I don't, I don't know what it is, but that's always a great one. All right, the last thing you need for job searching, this is really important. You need to create a mission to get out of bed every day. You know, it feels sometimes really defeating. If you've been let go from a job, it's like someone just broke up with you. You know, it feels very defeating. Even if you knew they were a bad boyfriend or relationship or girlfriend or, you know, partner or whatever it was. Um, when you're dating, it's still, you know, it feels defeating. It feels the same way when you're, job, you know, when you lose a job that you maybe didn't want, and maybe that's why you got laid off, but you know, you're, you still feel defeated. And so you need to, you know, wash all that aside, you know, people lose jobs and it's not a big deal. If you consistently lose jobs, you need to get some professional help and figure out why you like go, go, you know, come, come to our place, come, you know, figure out why this is happening and let's, let's course correct. Right. But otherwise just, you know, again, I think the best way to get over being let go from a job is to find how you want to bring value to let go of you in the process and to look at how do you really want to bring value and impact in the world? Cause that's, what's going to get you up every day. Right. All right, the next thing I want you to think about is targeting the right roles. We talked a little bit about scaffolding, right? But there's actually different tracks within the scaffolding for growth. And, um, and I've kind of narrowed it down to three. <laughs> and it's really, do you wanna be a leader or future leader? Or do you wanna be in the doing mode? And if you wanna grow, that's fine, but then you've gotta become a, a subject matter expert or a thought leader in that field, right? which is great. Some people don't want to manage people. That's a great place for them to be. If you want to be an expert in your field, that it's a beautiful place to be, but you also still need to grow and nurture that pathway in order to have your income increase. Right. Um, the third way is to be what I call an entrepreneur or an eventual entrepreneur or consultant, which is kind of a mouthful to say, right. And I'm a true believer in the concept of being an entrepreneur. So you know, there's a lot of people that have the entrepreneurial experience, but they don't necessarily, they might be too ADD or they might just be too scared to go out on their own and, and who could blame them? Like today, it's really hard. 70% of jobs or 70% of startups fail, right? Which is, which is awful. And it's, it's a, it's a rough road, right? You got to be tough if you want to be an entrepreneur. So I always say, if you really want to go that route, you know, find the role um, the company that you would like to mimic that you would like to own someday and go work in there and learn everything scaffold up in there, become an entrepreneur in there, help them grow, expand the company, learn everything operationally, you know, um, learn how to optimize it, learn everything that you can about how to run that company and then go start your own. And then you come with clout, right? You can get funding for that. You can get people to back you up because you're coming with great experience. My sister-in-law that started that company, the reason that she got funding was that um, her billion dollar company that she started, the reason she you know, got funding was that she scaffolded up um, in startups to this place where she was operationalizing everything in such an optimized way, had such a great track record that these angel backers came to her and said, hey, we have X millions of dollars and we want you to pick what type of company you want to start, you know, building and, and, um, and we believe in you, right? So that's how those things can happen. So consider that if you're, if you're growing in any of these, you just need to think about it, find a mentor or coach or a, um, sponsor, a sponsor is someone that's two people up above you. That's going to help, you know, pull you up, give you projects from below. You're going to support them. That's a sponsor. Okay. So find a sponsor. A mentor is someone that just wants to help you out somehow. They just want to give you advice. You know, they want to help, you know, mentor you in a little specific way. A sponsor, like you have a relationship with, um, and you guys are supporting each other along the way, right? So find someone in that arena to help you continue to grow and get coaching, get help along the way. All right. So your professional brand, why is it so important? Right. So, you know, professional brand, it sounds so shallow. It sounds so, you know, oh, I'm branding, the whole, you know. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge like Facebooker. I'm not, you know, any of that, but what it, what it, what it really means to me is that you're finding the authentic reason, your legacy of why, why, you know, you want to work and who you want to become. And that that's huge. That's really huge. If you 
authentically believe in that, if you feel it, um, if you know, if you are uh, living that <laughs> um, legacy, you know, people really gravitate toward that. And that's going to help your growth hugely. So it's, it's conveyed in different ways, people that are strategic about it, and not in a, a superficial way, they just know the power of owning who you are, and how you want to bring value to others and to workplaces. Those are the people that really do well. I mean, it's coming from a place of authenticity, not a place of, you know, falseness. It's really, it's, so it's really important. It's the way you're known today and how you'll be remembered when you leave, right? But most importantly, and this, this really resonates that it reflects who you are, which is really more important than what you do, right? So many people ask you, you know, what do you do for a living? But they don't ask you who you are, right? So who do you want to be? You could be a janitor working. There was a great study about this. <laughs> this, you know, the, the, you know, there there are people that are in the the you know lower rungs working, and it's not about, um, it's not it's not about their job. It's about the value that they bring in their job, the joy, the happiness, right? So incorporate that into your brand and put a mission and drive to it because it's kind of a rough labor market out there sometimes. You know, my sister is, you know, um, working as a professor and it's, it's, it's tough. You know, there's a lot of pressure in academia. There's a lot of pressure in every role. And I know you guys can relate to that. So if you have that brand, if you get up and you're like, I'm getting up today because I, I want to make this, you know, I want to help people in this way. I want to help, you know, this is important to me. I want to help the, the planet in some way. I want to help this country in some way. I want to help communities, whatever it is, find that, find that and have that mission be part of your brand, right? That's your why, right? And then look and find leaders who are doing it and connect with them, have them help you. You guys help each other, band together, okay? All right, so let's talk about, you know, the next start. You, you, you have a brand, you built it, right? You're gonna put this down on paper. You're gonna work with someone on this, whatever it is. Um, then you're gonna put this on your resume. And it's really important that this shows on your resume. Look at the difference. I get people that come in, which is fine. I mean, that's why they're hiring me. I get people that come in, they're like, I'm not getting traction. This is this came from someone. So so this is what it'll look like, you know? And so your resume reflects you, just like the clothes you wear or the first image someone has of you. This resonates of um of intellectual um. I would say mostly like for, for your resume to have it organized, you know, it organized, like conceptually organized, um, which is really important. Like you laid it out in a way to make it user friendly and people appreciate that. They're like, oh, if they're going to put this kind of effort and detail into their resume. They're going to do it in our job. So I want to make sure that you, you know, are, are able to, to build something that you are proud of for your resume. Your resume needs to convey in your um, experience not just what you do. And that's where most people, you know, fall short. Like they put what they do, but they don't put the results around it. So it might be, um, I, um, I worked with 500 clients, um, and I improved, uh, and I improved sales, but they didn't put like how much they improved sales. Right. So your results, um, your top projects that you put on there really, you know, convey what you can do for a company. And it's, it's exactly what justifies your value-based salary. So it really helps to pull this out. And by pulling it out, like we'll go through with clients, we'll, we'll go through the professional experience first. So if you don't have, you know, if you, you can't hire someone like me, that's fine. Have someone, a friend, someone, a friend, colleague, partner, someone go through your resume with you and ask you to pull out the results with you right? Obviously not your boss. <laughs> um, ask them, you know, to help you come up with results. And by doing so, what's so great is you really remember all that you do. And that starts authentically building your confidence, you know, um, which is really important. We want you to go into the interview process with this authentic confidence. All right. Next thing um, would be, uh, there's always a controversy of first page uh, or one page versus two page resumes, right? So, uh, you know, how long should my resume be? It, mu it must be too short. Um, and let me, let me clear that up for you right now, All right? There's really two people that are looking, probably more, but two people 
that you have to think of that are, are the audiences for looking at your resume. And the first person could be a recruiter, like I do sometimes. It could be, you know, someone hired to uh, get all the resumes together to pull the talent in for the interviews, right? The second person is going to be the logical boss, the person that's hiring you. So, um, you know, at the top, the high level, the C level, it could be a board member, right? Or other C-suite people. So, so the first page, or, you know, when they talk about one page, the first person, the, the recruiter, the person that's pulling in all the talent, they just want to connect the dots. They want to make sure you check all the boxes for the job description. So what we started doing and what you could do for your resume is we started putting your top three to five strengths at the top of your resume. It has your overview metrics. It has, you know, all the things that are the top three to five things that most people want and the roles that you're applying for. It's also the perfect place after you build your master resume to make a copy of and to take your resume and retool it for every job that you're going for. Like if you're going for two jobs, they have very similar things, but one job is saying, oh, I really need someone to be good at customer success and you have that experience, then put that in your top three to five strengths, change out one of them, you know, change out the irrelevant one if there is one. Okay, or somehow add it into your top three to five strengths. So when we do this, it makes it so much easier for people to align their jobs to the to the resume. And you need to do that for every job in which you apply or you're sending, you know, you're sending to someone, a recruiter, or you're networking out and you're just sending your resume. If there's a role you're going for, make sure that you align it. And that top place is the best place. You just want to connect the dots. People don't want to sit there and interpret your resume. You know, what, what you know, people go through, it's, it's three, to, I think it's six seconds, they say, and it's true. Everything on your resume needs to be no more than two lines, all bulleted, 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 speed read through that puppy. That's what that is. So, you know, there's that first page, which has your top three to five strengths that acts as the one page. The other two pages are really your traditional resume that has your professional experience on it, right? So, so um, some people I would say for the most part have two to three pages at our company when we get done working with them. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say mostly it's on average three, you know, and depending on your profession, sometimes it's four. If you're like in a science, you know, um, like any kind of science or academia or, you know, computer, uh, like tech projects, uh, tech people sometimes have a lot of projects they need to list. So, so then that can expand. It's not the length it's, can they speed read through it? <laughs> and is it compiled in a way that's easy to grasp exactly what they need? Right. So that's how we've compiled this. And I think it would be helpful. I'll show you an example in a minute. All right. So next thing you know, um, cover letter, skip it. <laughs> I'm getting to that point where I'm like, skip it. I just talked to a recruiter the other day. She's like, yep, I don't read them either. And the reason is, is they come through the applicant tracking system and people upload their cover letter, they upload their resume and it doesn't come together at the same time. So either if people label them different, you know, digitally, like they don't, they don't in alphabetical order line up. And I'm not looking for a cover letter. Like I really just want to look at the resume for six seconds. Right. And so, so that's the hard piece of that. So um, you can do a cover letter for sure. If you're sending it to someone and you know, they're going to get that cover letter add it. your cover letter is really just supposed to quickly state why that company, why you, and then the top three to five things they need um, and how you speak to that. So it's the same thing as what we do on our resumes, which is that what we call areas of strength and effectiveness, which is your, your three to five top areas of strengths, right? So I started thinking the other day, and I actually just changed this, I'm not kidding, within the last month. Um, I started taking the overview statement and making that a quick hello, you know, and putting that in there. And then there's your, you know, top three to five strengths. And this is what you speak to and align to the job description. And then there goes your professional experience, you know? So there is no right way or wrong way. It's kind of this subjective art form, your resume, but I'm just telling you from a recruiting and then a marketing standpoint, what the need of the resume is. It's really just to align your, you know, your abilities to, to the um, job description and to stand out as well, right? All right, LinkedIn profile. All the stuff, you know, um, you take once you build your resume and you put it on your LinkedIn, you know, it's really, you know, a lot of recruiters look at that. There's no resume, right? So you don't want to add your resume if you're in a job, but if you're out of a job, add the resume. I would also say in LinkedIn, if you've seen that green open to work, you know, um, on there, please take it off and just 
change it to recruiters only. And, you know, we could talk about this during the open discussion, but I feel like it makes people look um, desperate. And the last thing I want you to look is desperate. I don't want you to feel desperate. I don't want you to look desperate. So just take it off. If you set it to recruiters only, it's not public viewing. Not everyone needs to know that you're looking for work. You know, just take it off. You're going to be networking anyway to the right places proactively, targeting the right places. So you don't really need that. Okay. They'll, they'll find you anyway. I promise. Um, all right. So, so this is an example of, you know, like a resume that you could do, right? So here's the overview statements, the top three to five strengths. We have this other area, people are visual. So it, it's a way of making things stand out. Sometimes we'll put top projects on there. Sometimes we'll put tech or different industries they've worked in, things that make them stand out. And then again, this is their professional experience. And we keep an area to make it easy for you to keyword optimize. And you should put this on your resume. We call it skills and industry expertise. And that's where you plop in your keywords. You need a tool to find the keywords. And the tool typically, the two that we use are job scan, but it's $50 a month. So it's job scan. You can get some free scans though. And then job analytics. it's called job analytics. Um, and it is a Chrome extension. And um, what you do is you go to a job description, the URL, and then you upload your resume onto it. And it says, hey, you're missing these keywords. And then you can just copy them right in there. It's not as thorough. It doesn't get quite as many keywords we've noticed, um, but it is a way of doing it. If you are sending stuff out and you feel like you should have been called for that interview, there's two reasons why that's probably not, maybe three reasons why it's not happening. One, your resume might not look professional or maybe four. So there's your, you know, your resume might not look professional. Your, um, you're not aligning easily for them to see that you're the right person. You're not keyword optimized would be the other reason. Um, or maybe, you know, a networking effort would have helped to get you in for an interview. So those are the reasons typically that people don't get them. Um, if you're doing all this and you're not keyword optimizing and you're getting these reject letters, it's because you don't have 50% of the keywords and each keyword is specific to the job description. It's not a one and done thing. So you need to make sure that you are, um, keyword optimizing for each resume. So, you know, a job description might have manager in there and you have management. It doesn't take derivatives. If it has managers and you have manager, it doesn't take it because it's not the same. It's not, you know, singular versus plural doesn't count it. So um, it'll just automatically bump it out, which is a bummer. That's how a lot of people get missed, right? Right. So that's basically what that piece talked about. All right, let's talk about the big nuts and bolts of applying and networks. And we, we just kind of talked a little bit about the applying piece, right? So um, this one will go fast, but 85% um, of jobs come from some form of networking. And I see it, I see it in the company, I see it. And I'm an introvert, so I'll have to say that I would almost, you know, rather that not be the case, but that is the case. And so if you are an introvert, introverts have a harder time doing this. Like you really have to make yourself do it. We, we you know, we use, um, we actually have a service that does this through your behalf, through your LinkedIn for you. Um, we, do, we do that for this reason, because one, sometimes people don't have time because they're working. And two, you know, they're, they're introverted. It's hard, you know, but when they receive the emails and they're like, yeah, sure, let's talk, then it's a little bit easier, right? Than proactively looking. So it's hard, you know, again, it's a consultative sales effort almost to look for a job. So it means you have to reach out to a lot of people. Um, the other thing that you should know is that 80%, this is high, you guys, 80% of jobs posted are not even legit. Um, and you don't know what they are. <laughs> you don't know which ones they are. So you have to apply. You have to apply. And I say on a scale of one to 10 and 10 being the highest, you really want that job, only apply for jobs that are like eight to 10. Because the amount of effort that you put into the whole job application process versus just networking out for, you know, for work is so much more. It's so much greater when only 20% of the jobs are legit and why they're not legit is for various reasons. One, they could be, you know, old. They're still on the job boards. I put job postings up myself for my site. People are still sending me stuff for months later, right? I took it off but it's, it's still showing up. The internet grabs it, you know, it just goes, it gets passed around. 
The other one is, you know, the job's already spoken for, they had to post it for due diligence, right? For legal reasons, they had to post it. The other one is, um, the, you know, sometimes people need to get funding and if they post jobs, it looks like the company is growing. And so it's a little easier to get funding. There's many reasons why it doesn't work out, but that's the reason what research says is 80%. Right. So if you're going to post or if you're going to apply eight to 10 and you need to do these things, you have to have to have to. Um, well, the uh, first before that um, alerts, if you're going to set alerts, the only place you need to set alerts, you don't need to go to Indeed, you don't need to go to LinkedIn, Glassdoor, all these places. Just go to Google Jobs. Google Jobs is an aggregator. So if you type in the search engine Google Jobs, the first thing you'll see is Google Careers. Um, but Google careers is for the company site, right? But if you scroll down, you'll see a box with a blue header and it says jobs, you know, on there, click on the blue header and that'll bring you into Google jobs, which is an aggregator. It brings in all these different, you know, types of, um, all these different types of, uh, jobs for you and you can set your alerts there so therefore they'll email you right when alerts happen you're not getting them from 17 million different places everyone like reposts all over the place so if you're doing this in indeed in glass or you're going to get all this repetition it's going to be too much it's oh my god it's just going to be so add it's going to make you crazy so only do google jobs okay and then the next thing you need to make sure is that you and so and only answer only answer the fresh ones, only answer the fresh ones. If you find something on a job board that wasn't sent to you, that was fresh from Google, I would, I would go to the company website and make sure it's still posted because there's nothing worse than posting, you know, or going through the whole job application process, you go to post and then like, it doesn't take it. It just, this job was already taken, you know? So make sure, you know, that it's, it's fresh. I, I always say, go to the company website and apply for the job. Don't do the LinkedIn easy apply. It's just a big resume dump. You know, I worked at a company. I don't even know where they went. Honestly, don't do the LinkedIn uh, like easy apply. Make sure you go to the company website and apply. Okay. Next thing you need to make sure is that you keyword optimize and align your resume for every job. So we just talked about that. You need to make sure you use job analytics or job scan or whatever source that you find out there that might be better. We love those. It's the ones we keep using. Um, and I would make sure that you dump them into, <laughs> into your skills and industry expertise, make it easy. Just don't, so you don't have to recraft all these sentences, just have a place on your resume that you can add them all. Right. And then the last thing, which is the most important thing, if you're going through the application process, I want you to go through, and I'm going to try and show you this on here. I want you to find the people that you would reach out to. Um, LinkedIn is the best place, and I'm going to use Zoom as an example, and try and find those people to get a hold of it. Introduce yourself, add your resume in, just send them a short note and say, I'm really interested in this role. We'd love to jump on an informational call with you. Here's what I sent in for the role, my resume. Because the whole goal is to get on their radar. Not that they even have to get back to you, but to get on their radar. Um, and I want you to send your resume because it's visual. Like, Make sure you save it as a PDF. Um, but it hopefully will be visual. Hopefully you'll change it in that way. Um, it's unique. It's set up in a unique way. Um, and I want you to introduce yourself for that role and see if they can jump on an informational call. They're probably not going to get back to you and that's okay, but you might, you know, very well, you have a higher chance of getting a call for an interview way higher. People just need that connection. Like they just want to know, Ooh, this person really wants this job. And that's who they want to hire is someone that really wants a job, but they made the effort to find them. So this is how you find them. Okay. So you go to the company, what, you know, company page on LinkedIn here, and you go to people, you could always try and search them on here, but I find that this is better. And let's just say I'm trying to find them in Denver. Okay. And maybe I'm looking for a VP of program, right? So I'm going to pull this up here. And I'm looking for someone that's like a V, you know, pro, I'm just going to look at program and see who shows up, right? There might not, there might be like product. I don't even know who's here. Okay. There's program specialist, program manager, right? Let's just say I need the program manager. So, and I find, oh, Karen's the person, right? What if there's like multiple program managers? Well, first I'm going to look at the job description and match the department. Does the department match, right? If I'm still unsure and there's three program managers, I'm going to reach out to all three. <laughs> I'm going to reach out to them and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to click on here um, and, and it's going to make me connect, right? I have to connect before I can do anything. So I'll click on connect here and it'll say, can you add a note and just say, you know, um, 
you could connect this way. I still think the better way is to get um, a sales navigator or a career premium account and be able to just in-mail them. And when you in-mail them, you could just create a message and you can add your resume in there. Otherwise you have to connect with them first and then they have to connect back and then you have to remember and you have to send them, you know, I think that's a better way. So um, anyway, so if there's three people, I'm going to reach out to them. If there's a talent person running this search and it's on there, it's listed, I'm going to reach out to them. Um, so that's how you try, you try and reach whoever's around that role and introduce yourself and say, hey, you know, is there a way that you can introduce me to the person that has this role? And, and when you reach out, just say, hey, if I'm reaching out to the wrong person, let's say there's three program managers, you can say, hey, if I'm reaching out to the wrong person, um, can I, um, you know, just, uh, can you can you get back to me, right? Or can you, can you point me to the right person, right? So, God, we're really hitting time here, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, all right. So beyond that, you know, that's how, and when you network, you know, this is how you find your companies and you reach out to them and you do the same thing. You try and jump on informational calls. You give them your top three ways that you have value and you track all of this on some Excel spreadsheet. Just make sure that you're tracking this on Excel spreadsheet. So I always think, you know, there was a guy that really wanted a Zoom job. And so he, he went around to all the people around his role and he just kept kind of pinging them until he got an interview and he ended up getting a job there. So you got to really want it. You got to want to bring value to it. Um, and that's, that's the way you get these jobs, right? So, um, so let's keep going and uh, then I'll answer with questions. I'm sorry if I'm going over here. All right. So we've done this, the interview prep, I'm not going to go too far in, but there is a consultative method and you can read about this on the PDF because I really want to leave time for you guys to ask questions. Um, but we have a great consultative method, method, but if you kind of, you know, read through this, basically you're researching the company, you're, you're approaching it like a consultant, you're asking questions, you're noting what they want. Um, and, and that's basically it. Um, salary negotiation. That's, that's really huge. So I want you to make sure that you're doing the research that you need to find out where your salary, you know, where your salary range is. And based on the metrics that you come up with, where should you be around that? You know, it's always good to get professional help with this because it pays for itself tenfold. So if you can get professional help with uh, salary negotiations, I really, really would recommend it. Um, never, ever, ever tell them what salary that you're making or that you want at the beginning of this. It's like showing your cards in a poker game. So make sure that you never tell them that um, because you can always negotiate for a value-based salary. So the key is, is your goal is to find out where their ceiling is, okay? Which feels a little scary. Everyone's always afraid that they're gonna pull back. But negotiations is always a part of the process. You should always, always, always salary negotiate, okay? They'll tell you if they can't go higher. They'll tell you if they pull out for any reason, then there's something else going on. Like they just all of a sudden pulled funding or something weird has happened. Um, if you're negotiating and you're doing it in a kind way and each time you're telling them that you want to bring value, you know, um, that you're really excited that you're going to, you know, come in and you can't wait to create whatever transformation that they're asking for. You can't wait to start. You just want to get paid according to your value. And you have consistently shown this proven track record, right? Which is why it's so important to have those metrics. Um, then that's how you can get the salary that you need. And you just need to hit that. You know, you just need to go to a place where they're like, oh, we can't, you know, you want to go higher. You want to go a little higher than where you want to end up, obviously. And they'll tell you where their ceiling is is how that kind of works. You'll kind of go back and forth a little bit. And there's different aspects you can negotiate on, you know, um, not just the salary, obviously there's benefits, there's, um, you know, stock options, all those different pieces. Um, so it gets more complex and, and for sure get, you know, help. I can't tell you all of this in, in, in a couple of minutes, but that's basically it. All right, so just know that it's really important to invest in your career and your salary it really greatly affects your happiness and how you feel you know, you're making impact in life. And I want you to know that we're here. We specialize in this if you need it. Um, we're offering you a 10% discount till the end of this year. Um, a lot of people are starting to gear up for you know, January. There's still jobs out there right now if you need it. Um, but then there's a lot a huge hiring, you know, always happens at the beginning of January. A lot of people are closing their books at the end of December. So it's really the best time, you know, in December is the best time to gear up and get ready 
to start applying for the roles that you really want that usually come up about around January. Okay. And then also, if you go to this right here, career5.com forward slash uh, CSM for School of Minds, know that we have, you know, there's a free resume review and job search strategy document that you can download. Okay. Um, so that's it. Uh, Julie, are you still there? <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you so I was much. like, oh my God, it's so late. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. That, um, it's a okay. great, great information, great content. Thank you so much. So uh, if you have time, Amy, um, yeah. do you want to stick around for a couple of questions? Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Yeah. Awesome. So guys, we will open up the floor. Um, we'll take maybe about, I think, uh, 10 minutes. Um, thank you all for still staying on. If you do have any questions, please feel free to Put your questions in the chat or you can also go down to your reactions raise your hand um, and we will call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question and while we are waiting for people to kind of think of their questions um oh we actually have a <laughs> keegan uh you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question thank you so much for doing this Bye, How Keegan. would you suggest answering when you are in one of the final interview process and the senior HR person asks you, what salary do you think you would be your minimum? And you're prepared to say, due to my value, I believe that this is a fair salary. And they come back five or $10,000 under that. Okay. So first off, if you're in the interview, you should not be negotiating at all. And so people will try that and that's fine. So your answer to that would be, which is hard, right? I mean, cause once you, once you lay out a number, it's in their head, you know, and you don't know all the facts yet. You don't know what benefits you're getting any of that. So, so the best way to answer that is just to say, you know, I'm, I'm not really comfortable talking about um, salary yet um, until I get an offer and I see all that's on the table. Um, but that being said, you know, I'm sure you guys are going to be fair about it. And um, uh, what I would like to ask you is what is the range that you have? And so then you put it back on them and they'll tell you what the range is and just say, yes, you know, we're in the ballpark. And I, you know, I don't think right now is a good time to talk, you know, she, if they keep push, pushing the low piece, just again, you know, just say, I'm just, you know, I'd rather wait until we get a job offer, but um, you're, you know, I'm kind of hearing where you're at and I think we're right within the ballpark we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely come to agreement and then, and then try and redirect them. <laughs> so I would say to try and redirect them to, um, a question like what's, you know, what's your 30, 60, 90 day expectations for this role and try and get them off that. Okay. They just want to see if, if you're in the range and you'll, you'll get a feel for that. Right. Um, but I still always believe get to the place of the offer, whether it feels too low or not, because, there's always room for negotiation. And if you can prove how much value you can bring, they'll change their mind sometimes. Like if they're, you know, if they're at a 20,000 lower than where you'd like to be, you know, and that, that's the hard thing you'd like to know. In Colorado, they're starting to um, put on their, the range so people know, right? And they're not wasting each other's time. But you, you know, you just have to think of it as interview experience, really, you know? Thank you. Yeah, it's just not perfect, <laughs> but don't answer. Definitely don't answer because that's laying your cards out. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Keegan. So um, going off of salary, uh, we just had a question come in. Uh, so it says with salary range and position descriptions now for Colorado, at least, mm -hmm. um, should I apply to jobs that are below my acceptable salary range with the hope of negotiating after an offer has been made? Yeah, I would say if you really like the company and, and would like to work there, you also have to think about the long-term growth opportunity. Um, and, and again, I think that you could negotiate depending on the company. And here's the thing, too, to remember, you guys, um, when, you when you go out there and you interview, um, if, if they fall below and you just can't make it happen, right? I mean, no one's going to take a $20,000 cut, right? So um, for, for a salary, unless they absolutely wanted to be at that company, but you have to think it's also a way of you're connecting, you're making connections with them. And so if you can leave it on good terms, like, you know, A, they might open up another role. Like I've seen people open up other roles, right? Or something comes down the line, like a client today said, Hey, you know what? This company opened up that other position. They said they would, the first one was too low. And then they contacted her to apply for it. So yeah, definitely. I, I would, I would still go for it. Yeah. That's really great advice. Thank you, Amy. Um, we've got a couple more questions coming in. 
Um, we'll do one last one on salary and then we have some other ones as well. So one last one for salary. Um, what is your advice on negotiating salary when you are advancing to the next level, level in a company that you're already working for? Yeah, great question. Great question. I, I had that too recently. So, um, so if you were, um, if you're currently negotiating for something higher and you guys have already had a conversation and you kind of know where that is at, there's a couple of things to think about when you're actually salary negotiating. So if you're moving to the other company and the offer is on the table um, and you said, well, right now I'm already negotiating for this amount at this company, there's other factors, you know, so, so definitely, um, I would say this, I would say, you know, um, I'm actually negotiating for a salary similar to this. And if I'm going to move to a different company, um, I would, uh, you know, and I'm going to come here, I would rather it, you know, I think I need it to be at this level. And based on the proven track record that I have, this is really the level I should be at. Um, so I am negotiating something similar at the current company and people get that compensation managers actually get that they get that they're not going to get someone if they're, you know, negotiating for the same thing at a company, they don't have to move, you know, they're already there. Right. The other thing that you need to remember is if you have a bonus coming um, and you're due for a bonus, you can negotiate for that as a signing bonus. So if you were due, you know that you're going to get, you know, $10,000 in December and you're moving to another company, you could tell them, hey, I, you know, I would like that as a, as a signing bonus or part of the contract, you know, as a, a bonus, um, because I don't want to lose that, you know, so companies get, company get, you know, they get that they're bringing over talent. And if, if, um, and if you're worth it, they really want you, they're going to, they know that, you know, you're not going to take a lateral move or you're not going to take a dip in salary or any of that, you're, you're moving for growth. They get all that. So don't be afraid to ask for what you deserve and what you need. Okay. Yeah. But it's all based on value. You can't just say I deserve it. <laughs> like it has to be based on your proven track record, right. And your results and the transformation you can make really. So, so definitely have that information prepared going. Yes. Into yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's your, it's your ammo for sure. Yeah. Um, Hazen, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Amy, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Hazen. Okay, perfect. Uh, I had a question. Earlier you spoke to, um, when looking at the qualifications for a job posting, that you might only meet 70% of those. Mm -hmm. um, I find that's one of the more discouraging aspects when I'm applying to, yeah. to new jobs, is I don't feel, you know, what's know the point does. if I don't have <laughs> these specific qualifications? How do you then market what you do have to make up for for what you might be lacking, especially when some of them get quite specific. Yeah, so so the key is, I think, to know what is a requirement for them and what is it that they're just asking. So if it's not listed as a requirement, and that doesn't mean even if it is listed as a requirement, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it, okay? But you can tell, like if it says requirement, that means they have to have it, okay? Or they prefer that you have it. <laughs> like sometimes they'll say preferred requirement. That doesn't mean you have to have it. That's just preferred. And then there's just requirement, right? So, um, so determine that first, I would say. And then I would, I would say it, it's just common. Like most jobs, people only have 70% of them. So you go in and you just speak to the 70% that you have. And then if there's anything valuable additionally that you have, like some people come from a, you know, one guy I was working with uh, is, is, is going into um, performance coaching, but he has a sales background, right? Which, so it was something completely, you know, not necessarily in the training field, but sales, right? So that's a huge value out. He understands. And most likely he will be doing performance coaching, maybe with salespeople or, you know, um, and so, so if you have anything like that value add, Hazen, that you can add to it, that's, that's the way to work around it. And, and, and if you get into an interview, the way you address it is just say, yeah, I did see that I was missing that. And then I've looked into ways I could get that, you know, that's what I would do. I would look and, you know, how can you get that if you need it? Right. Um, and again, you don't know until you know, right? So you might get into the interview. It might not be realistic for you to get it, right? They might not pick you because you don't have it. It doesn't matter if you can get into the interview and just, you know, try and work around it, um, then work around it, right? 
you'll just, you just don't know until you get to the end. Just think of every interview as interview practice, really. And you're just doing your best as a consultant. Just think of yourself as a consultant. I'm going in there when I, you know, interview and I just want to see what they need and see if it aligns to what I have and how can we work around it otherwise? You know, how can we create solutions around it? How can we, you know, and if it's not a good fit, then let it go. It's really that simple. You know, it takes the pressure off of you for being perfect for the role, right? So. Great, thank you, Hazen, for your question. Uh, we have two more questions, Amy, that we'll take. Um, so well, the first one is, uh, so you suggested that cover letters aren't as important um, mm -hmm. anymore because they aren't often read. So what do you think about after interview thank yous? The, the oh yeah, absolutely. They're still just as important? Oh yeah, they're definitely important. Yeah, the thank you is huge. And not only that, the thank you can be used and that's a great question as a recap. So, um, so it can be used as a recap for all the points that you heard that they needed and how you can speak to it. And it reminds them that you were listening, right? Like everyone feels good when, when you're listening to them and you re re recap back what you have been discussing, right? So sometimes people just, you know, start rambling off about themselves <laughs> And it's not about you. And, and that's why it really helps, I think, to get in that consultative out of, you know, uh, place. It's really about, hey, it sounded like, you know, if you're a consultant, you're going to the company, it sounded like you needed X, Y, and Z. And my company um, is great. We have a great track record of doing this. And we've done it before three times, right? And so if you're an employee, but thinking like a consultant, you're going to say it that way as well. You're going to say, hey, it sounds like, you know, uh, Jan, that you needed. X, Y, and Z, and I have all this experience um, that would be great for it. And I'm really excited about continuing talking about this role and what are the next steps. Um, some people, like when they get a couple interviews in, I almost, I almost would say when you, when you feel like, is this over? Is this not? I would go in and say, hey, you know, I'm still really excited about this. Can I come up with maybe a 30, 60, 90 day plan for you? And I know that feels a little daunting, but there's a ton of frameworks out there. And what you're really doing is just a loose structure. And if they say yes, just say, well, can you put me in touch with, it would be the person that would probably be your boss that you're going to get this from, this information and ask them, you know, can, is it okay if I talk to whoever that person is, right? The person that's going to hire me and ask them what their goals are so I can, you know, write up a plan. So I, you know, I know one woman that got a job just from that. And the guy was so happy that he asked that she asked him for the, what are his, his goals? You know, it wasn't just a loose, Hey, here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> it, it was more, and sometimes you can do that. Like if you can't talk to the logical boss, right. Person, sometimes, you, you know, you are, you're like, Hey, based on what we said, this is probably where I would start heading. However, it really would, you know, depend on the goals that you have for this, you know, like the specific goals, we only kind of did first layer goals. So take this lightly, but you know, and it means that you're putting the extra effort in to get the job. Does that make sense? Sometimes people will say things like, Hey, just, you know, give me a small project to work on just like a consultant. Let's, let's try it out. That's a way of doing it too. You know, if you feel like there is, um, something that's stopping the hiring process for some reason. It could be we're at, you know, we're in uh, October, end of October, end of year. They can't hire me until January. Just say, hey, why don't we do like a small project on a consultant contractor basis and see, you know, and that way you can see if this is a good fit. Do you see what I'm saying? So if that's a possibility for either person, offer that as well. Many people get into roles through that, you know, through that avenue. Amy, would you also say that, so say um, the 30, 60 day plan is really great, especially uh, for making the connection for what you could do for that role. But in your initial uh, follow-up emails back, would you say um, making note of if you guys talked about anything personal, like if you both like the Denver Broncos, would you say that that would be beneficial to note that? In the yeah, episode? yeah. Human, human connection is always great. The best bridge. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, how are you doing? How was the Broncos game? Did you blah, blah, blah? Hey, I just wanted to thank you again for the interview, right? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and absolutely, any, any form of human connection is always better. You know, just start off. Even when you're out there um, and looking for people on LinkedIn, see if you guys have a mutual connection, right? You can see those little bubbles right away on LinkedIn to see, you know, if you have a mutual connection. See if you guys went to the same school. See if you guys ever worked at the same place at 
maybe various different times. See if you're in the same LinkedIn groups or you're following the same people, anything that could be a connection. Does that make sense? That you're like, hey, I see that you're in, you know, I see that you're a Broncos fan or right, 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 like in the Broncos club on LinkedIn or what, you know, whatever that is, um, like something to just get them to stop to be like, oh, this isn't just a sales message coming through, right? <laughs> this is, you know, a human being trying to connect and, uh, you know, anything just to get their attention to, you know, try and connect, right? Yes. Not, in a, not in a rude way, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, start that way. personal connection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Start that talk. That's great. So yeah. one last question for you, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, this is, it says, I've received uh, conflicting information about gap time during the pandemic. Uh, so their question is if they now have this large gap in their resume in between jobs, um, does that look bad? No, um, there have been many, many, many people with gaps because of the pandemic and, um, and many people with gaps for various reasons. Um, and, and the key is to network in to get your jobs. You know, you can apply for sure, um, but if you apply, make sure you're networking along with applying, right, in those roles, and then make sure that you're also um, asking for people's help, asking for help. You know, there was one guy, he had an uncle died, he had health issues, took six years off, he did schooling, Right. So he did some education, some certification to keep him on track with where he was. Um, we put on his resume sabbatical. Right. Sabbatical. We kept it short because we didn't want to take away from all his great experience below. But we put sabbatical and we put um, uh, 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 working through, you know, what one of them could be personal investments or, you know. <laughs> had to deal with personal investments, um, did schooling, whatever the reason is, not nothing too heady, right? Or <laughs> um, deterring, I guess, right? Um, but people do it, we get it, you know, we all get it. We all, you know, we all get it really, right? Things happen, things happen. Sometimes people get cancer, you know, and they can't work and they, they got better and they're working again, but they don't wanna say cancer, right? So instead say something else, right? Dealing with personal investments took us compatible, you know? Um, or during, dealing with personal family issues. Like I would, I would leave off your personal health stuff, anything, anything I would leave off anything in the interview and, 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 you know, like personal health issues. Some people would really want to tell their story about their cancer struggle. And I'm like, tell them after you get the role, you know, cause anything that could cause a shadow of a doubt as the, you are the investment in their company. And it takes a long time for them to ramp you up, you know, just leave out until you get into the role because is, you know, because people don't know you and they, you know, so just the better, the better way of addressing it. Does that make sense? I'm not saying lie. I'm just saying, you know, it's personal. They don't have to know everything personal about you, right? You're there to work, right? You're there to be there for them, grow their company, right? Help them expand, bring value, all that. So, yeah. And Amy, um, kind of going off of, of that, um, we did have one question that just kind of stands out to me that also has to deal with that gap. And it's due to um, having to be a stay at home mom, but during that time they got their masters. So, yeah. you know, would you kind of, um, would you suggest to then place that on their, the resume during that time potentially? Yeah. So I, I put, you know, so sometimes people do that. They'll take, they'll go full time. Right. And, um, or they'll just, whatever, but whatever that time is just put their masters in their experience, even though it's down below, you know, masters. And then I would, I would say, um, uh, family investment opportunity. <laughs> they can talk about it in the interview. Everyone knows about stay home. You could say like operations. Op I, th I think moms are like the best operations optimizers. <laughs> They're the best CEO or COOs, you know, like seriously, and not just moms, dads too, but it's usually the stay home, whoever the stay home mom or parent or dad is like, that's operations optimization right there. And so, um, it makes me sad when people discount the value of that, you know, just the multi-layer, you know, whatever. And so, you know, you could kind of even make it a little fun, but just make it short, whatever it is, you know, however you state that, does that make sense? It's not, it just is what it is. And you're getting back into the workforce and, and you invested in your family and the whole world appreciates that. So thank you. Okay. Not that I was a stay home mom, you know, but I'm just saying that we, you know, appreciate you know, people yeah. that do take that time and invest in their family and they have that opportunity. I totally get it. So, 
and gaps obviously do not count you out of the job searching game and you're still a valid right. candidate and still valuable. So definitely, yep. um, you know, have confidence, right. And yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, what's hard is it, it feels like you're, you're stepping back into that world. It feels very daunting and it helps to get people along the way to, you know, to, um, help you somehow. Right. Does that make sense? So the networking is when you go out there and you network and you don't even know them, it's okay. You know, you ask people, Hey, can you help me? Like I've been out of the workforce. I've been as, you know, a single mom, but I have all this great past experience, or I'm really excited about getting back to work again. You know, I got my head in the game. My kids are grown. Like I just, you know, I'm fully hundred percent there. Is there any way that you can help me get back in? You'd be surprised. Like so many people, want to help. Like so many people want to help other people. So reach out, you know, cold email them and just ask for help. And it might feel, you know, like so many people, like not everyone's going to get back to you. It'll be a small percentage, but they'll get back. The people, you know, people will get back to you and that's all you need is that small percentage, you know? Definitely. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Amy. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here and for sharing your knowledge uh, with us. And also, um, everybody, please, please feel free to take, um, use of the free resume review that Amy's company is offering. Um, and then also reach out to, uh, career five. If you do have any specific needs or you want to, to work with Amy herself, I am going to post a link to our upcoming events in the chat box below. We have an upcoming, uh, career event on November 10th from six to seven. It's uh, living and working on the West Coast. Uh, so join us to hear from alumni, speak about their career paths, job opportunities, and industries on the West Coast. And yes, um, we will not forget to send you the uh, PDF file. We'll send a follow-up email. This recording will also be posted on our YouTube. Um, so we'll send all of that follow-up information. So you'll have this at your fingertips you know, to use for, for future during your job search. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And again, Amy, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm here for you if you need me. <laughs> okay. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks so much, Julie. Take care. Bye. Bye.